John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. (coughs) He himself was light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world. And through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. Yet to all who received him, <coughs> I'm sorry, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. <coughs> sorry. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. (coughs) For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Thank you, Amy. You know, a, a question that I've had for some time uh, that comes up every year when we get to the Christmas season is just how much did the original um, part of the nativity story, the people in the nativity story, uh, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, how much did they understand about what was going on? I mean, I, I mean, how much could they grasp? I mean, did the... Did the shepherds that, that night understand what was really happening, that, that, that God himself was coming to earth as a baby? I mean, they, they, they were expecting a king, they were expecting a Messiah, but did they know that this baby was the king, and did they know the, everything about him, I mean, that, that we know now? Or, or maybe Mary, you know, Mary carried this child, and she held him in her arms, and did she know what was really taking place that night? Um, Luke tells us that after the shepherds left that major scene, that Mary pondered all these things in her heart. She's trying to process this. And did she understand? And if, if she did, I mean, how is she able to handle this, this realization? And what about Joseph? I mean, he had an angel tell him that he should not divorce uh, Mary and tell him what to name the child, that he would be Jesus, uh, you know, Savior uh, was who he was to be. But, I mean, did he know that, that, that he would have been there at creation? Did they know, did he understand, even in part, who this baby was? And if he did understand or expect that, I mean, did he, did he change his mind later on when, when the baby would cry like any other baby and, and the child grew up in a human body like any other child would grow up? I mean, did, did, did they understand? I've always had that question. Now, today we want to talk about the real Christmas story. I mean, here's what really happened. The one who made the world, who made everything that is, became a part of creation and then entered the world as a human being. Uh, God became a man. And that's the real story. And I think we miss that at the holiday season. That's the news that's worthy of, of shouting from the housetops. And, and uh, I mean, that ought to be in lights and Times Square. Jesus is God. The baby is God. That ought to be, you know, everywhere that we see. And, and we ought to tweet that out and we ought to post that on Facebook. I mean, that's the real Christmas story is that the baby is God. It's really, you know, pretty astounding. Or as we would say, wow, that's unbelievable. Not, not that we don't really believe it, but it's like it's so big, it's so huge 
that we just can't take it all in. It and it just far beyond what we can imagine. And that's why I kind of doubt if the original nativity cast understood what was going on. Because it's it's far beyond what anyone could expect. See, I, I, I can grasp, and I don't know why, but I, I, can, I think it's out of necessity. I think it's out of necessity that I can grasp the reality that, that God created the world, just spoke it into being. I, you know, we, we need that. So You've got to have some you know, reason or, or some, some uh, means of explaining how things came into being. So I, I can ex- expect that. And I don't understand it, but I, I, I can grasp it. I, I can believe that. I can believe most of the miracles in their Bible are, you know, when I stop and think about them, like, like you know, the Noah and the ark. I can believe that. I can get my head around that. I can believe that God caused a, a wind to come up and, and open up the Red Sea, as it says, and, and they parted on dry ground. I, I, you know, I could get my head around that, the crossing of the Jordan on, on dry ground, and you know, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments up on, on Mount Sinai. I can expect that and accept this, but, but this, that God, God became a baby. I mean, the Creator became a, a creature. I mean, that's just... It's wild. I mean, it's huge. And do you see why I say that most people celebrate, who celebrate Christmas have never really heard this part of the story? We don't talk about this part of the story. What most have heard is about the innkeeper and poor Mary, and how tired she is, and she had to travel on a donkey. And, you know, the, the children are so cute, and it's good for them to learn that story, but you understand there's really no innkeeper in the Bible. I mean, you know that, don't you? In the, there's no donkey in the Bible either. We kind of fill that in to make it, you know, a better story for us uh, to do. But, you know, the, the smelly sheep and the donkeys and, and, and all that stuff. And um, people know about the star and the three wise men. It doesn't say how many there are, but, you know, we make it three to go with three gifts and, and that stuff. But not very many people have heard. The, the story. We don't talk about this, that the child was in fact the one through whom everything was made, as John says. Now, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made through Him, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word moved into our neighborhood, so to speak. God moved into our neighborhood and, and on our street. Um, Philip Yancey had, had a, a thought on this that I read years ago, and he had a great way of explaining you know, this part of God moving into our neighborhood uh, because um, we have this need to romanticize first century Bethlehem to be this wonderful candlelit uh, scene with little uh, houses on the hillsides. They all have one candle in the, in the window. <laughs> And everything is very tranquil. And you go, oh, I'd love to live in Bethlehem. And Philip Yancey kind of bursts our bubble with that, that Bethlehem was not a very nice place to live in the first century, you see, because all these empires have had kind of come through Israel, you know, the Assyrians and the Persians. And, and as they come through, they just, through, this, through the years, they just kind of wipe their feet on little Israel, and it takes a toll on them. And it's not a very nice place to be. The, you know, the Babylonians, and finally Alexander the Great, and then eventually, right before Jesus is born, we have a guy named, named Antiochus Epiphanes, and, and he does things that the, the most terrible things to the Jews have been done up until Hitler. I mean, he, he crucifies many of them. He transforms the temple, you know, into the temple of Zeus, and he performs these, you know, profane acts there. He kills priests who won't eat pork. He, he tries to make them eat pork, and if they don't do it, he kills them. And that's what's going on in, in Israel at the time. And, and little town of Bethlehem, you know, as we picture it, you know, this... This nice little suburb of Jerusalem, just a, just a few miles south, it's, a, it's re- really a, a land of terror, a land of persecution. And that's the neighborhood into which, you know, Jesus was born. It's really a Damascus. It's really uh, 
Baghdad or Kabul, the, the world, the word moved into this neighborhood. Now, the Greek word that John used for word is logos. Uh, that word is the root of logic or logical. And, um, I mean, why does he do this? Um, we often use the word to mean the Bible. That's not what he, John's talking about at all. It's much different than that. Why didn't John begin his story by calling um, Jesus the Son of God? I mean, wouldn't that have, he develops that theme in his gospel. Why not start within the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was God, and all things came into being by the Son, and the Son became flesh and dwelt among us. Why not say Son rather than call him Word or Logos? And the reason is because John wants to reach as many people as he can. He's not writing this gospel just for a few people. But by the time that he's writing this gospel, he has the Jews in mind. He has the Gentiles in mind. He has the whole world in mind. And this word logos, translated as word, does this, you see. The word crosses cultural and religious boundaries. And by using this word... Uh, logos. He, he's he's more going to say more about God becoming human than we can with any other word. Uh, for the Greek philosophers of his day, logos was a popular word and was used to describe the rational principle behind creation. Logos meant the created order, why the world worked the way that it was. For the Jews of the day, Philo, who was a contemporary here, uh, down in Alexandria, he had developed the, the idea of the Logos as the agent of creation, um, the act of God in the world. And he called the, the Logos the, the captain and the pilot of the universe. And for most of the Jews of his days, uh, Logos was the means of God expressing himself and communicating himself. So in the Old Testament, they, they, you know, the connection here is we think of like Psalm 33, 6. It says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And so when they translated this Hebrew into Greek, logos was the word that they put there for the old Hebrew word. Or Isaiah 48 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God uh, stands forever. So in short, I know you probably didn't come to get this kind of a lesson today, but um, in short, Logos was for them the means by which God expressed himself is what this meant. And so when the living God expresses himself, that expression is nothing less than God. In the beginning was the self-expression of God. And what, what John says is all this self-expression this is Jesus, it's who he is. We, we know that you know about Logos, you Greeks and you Jews, and what that means to you. But let me identify who the Logos is for you, he says. It's Jesus. Now, what if God came to us and said, you know, I'd like for you to um, explain in this gospel that I'm having you write who I am and what I'm doing in Jesus. What what would you use today? Uh, would you help me do this, God says, and in our day there are other ways, all less than what John does, but that we might try to get across the, the eternal plan and the action of God and Jesus. So we might say, in the beginning was the higher power. That term higher power is used a lot today for people that are in recovery, and it's kind of a, you know, a little bit ambiguous. It crosses over cultural lines, doesn't really name who that is. So we might say something like that. Uh, some of you might say, in the beginning was the force. You, you Trekkies should like that. I'm just trying, you know, Star, Star Wars. Oh, excuse me. Uh, see, see I, just, I just can't keep it straight. Um, um, we, we might say, are you Lord of the Rings? Here, I'm really getting out of my element. Okay, I'm trying. All right, look out of my helmet. You Lord of the Rings, you might say that in the beginning was Eru. Oh, that is supposedly, uh, yeah, you're impressed, right? Uh, with Google, you can do anything. You know? Now, those are all kind of inaccurate, but you get my point. We would use 
other contemporary means of expressing who the ultimate God of the universe is. And for John in his day, you know, he would say, Logos. He has a name. He took a body. And the Logos is Jesus. I think he begins like this to make sure that we get the rest of the story correct. He, he wants us to realize that Mary's child, this man from Galilee, this one they heard and followed and saw as a real man, was in fact the maker of the universe. The same man who got tired, the same man that they traveled with, he was God. He was part of creation, the creator. He was the same man who in the beginning made the first hydrogen atom and the first oxygen Adam and said, I think it'll take two of the hydrogen with one oxygen to make water. That's who this was. He was the same person. And we forget that perhaps while we're doing all the rest of the stuff that we're doing at Christmas. That's the story. Ricky Bobby may like to pray to little baby Jesus because he's so approachable, but he, he never was any less than unbelievably astonishing, mind-boggling. He's always been the same. If our Milky Way galaxy were the size, uh, we, we try different ways to understand creation, but here's one an, another attempt. If our Milky Way galaxy were the size of the entire continent of North America, our solar system would fit in a coffee cup. That's an attempt. The Milky Way is the size of all of North America, and one little coffee cup holds our solar system. And even now, two Voyager spacecraft are traveling towards the edge of the solar system. They've been doing that for almost 30 years. They're traveling at 100,000 miles an hour. They're not there yet, even to the edge of our solar system, and that's in just one little coffee cup and our galaxy. The galaxy alone is the size of North America. So when engineers beam a command to one of these spacecraft, at the speed of light, it takes 13 hours for it to arrive there. And yet the vast neighborhood of our sun, in truth, the size of a coffee cup, fits along with 700 billion other stars and their minions in the Milky Way. One of perhaps 100 billion such galaxies, 100 billion galaxies in the universe, and we're not sure that this is the only universe. So to lend, send a, a light speed message to the edge of that universe would take 15 billion years. So this, this Logos, he made 100 or 10 billion trillion stars. That's a 10 followed by 15 zeros. That's how many stars this Logos made, this baby that's in the manger. And he made those, a little baby. And at no time, tack this on there, at no time was he any less than that. He was always fully God. Never was he any less. So while Caesar Augustus had declared himself Son of God, and declared himself to be God Almighty, ruler of the world, Jesus was trying to sleep in a carved-out limestone trough. And while Romans sent their, their tax collectors to, to get more money so they could build palaces in, in Rome, the, the Logos had entrusted himself to a, to a young first-time mother who was far from home and her husband's family had refused to let her stay in their house. The guest room was closed to her, so she had to go sleep with the animals. And while Herod was in his palace in Jerusalem, the, the one who, it says, flung the stars into space was a refugee because Herod had decided that he might be a threat and killed all male children under age two. He was never less during all of that. Paul would try to explain who this baby was with similar words. Colossians 1, 15 to 17, kind of a, a sister passage to John 1. He is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. See, same message, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and by him, or excuse me, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I love that last passage. This Logos, this Jesus, he's the gravity of the world, everything holds together. He's the glue. It all falls apart if he's not there. And that's in keeping with the Greek and the Jewish concept of logos as well as the world word is the glue, the the order of creation and nature. He is the one that gives created order to our world. Ever wonder why the hummingbirds all know how much to eat and when to leave for Texas and Mexico. That little bitty brain that they've got. The Logos. He's the glue. He holds it all together. This time of year, as you're driving around town, you'll see the starlings as they fly in those flocks. Isn't that wonderful to see them as they swirl around? Have you all noticed how they do that? And it's like there's some maestro telling them, you know, which way to go just instantaneously. Who is it that's doing that? It's the Logos. It's the one who created it all and holds everything together. Well, the theological word for all of this, this unbelievable, incredible truth is incarnation. It literally literally means in fleshness. Christmas is celebrating and receiving this astonishing news that God has taken on a flesh. And here is how we will know that happened. And you will find a baby lying in a manger, the angel tells the shepherds. This is the sign. Unbelievable. Just mind-blowing. God takes flesh. Charles Wesley tried to get his, this into words in one of his, his Christmas hymns. He said, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased with men to men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. C.S. Lewis said in the Chronicles of Narnia, he says, In our world, too, a stable once had something in it bigger than the whole world. That's who he is. Now, the implications are as almost as unbelievable, as mind-blowing as all of this news that John and Paul give us. In the real story he told, we humans have been given an incredible dignity by God becoming a human being. If God became flesh, then we who are fleshly, well, we're never going to be the same. No matter how low your life gets, you are made in the image of God, and Jesus Christ has confirmed that image by becoming one like you. He gives dignity to our human nature Second, we see that the real story is told. We see the incredible depth of God's love. God altered the state of his own being. Before Christmas, the the incarnation, God was just pure spirit. But at Bethlehem, God took upon himself our humanity. God became what he was not. He became human so that we might be free, so that we might become fully human in Christ. The third implication that I think of is that we have comfort in our pain and in our suffering. The Word became flesh. God became humanity and entered into the pain of humans. As it says in Hebrews, He entered into our weakness. Well, we have a high priest who who knows what it is to be human. He sympathizes with our walk. He knows what it is to be one of us. And if we look at the real story... We have an incredible hope for the future. We have certain certainty that we and this world are going to be made whole. It's the story's not over. That that holy night, God joined Himself with us forever, and God chose us. It says to be His children. Yet all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. If we receive this story of Christmas, then what? Jesus' claim and promise 
becomes completely believable. It becomes logical, you see. It's not logical unless he is, in fact, God. If he is the Word, if he is the one who was there from the beginning, through whom all things were made and were made for him, if he is the Logos, the self-expression of God, the order of all that is, that it makes sense for him to say and to do some things that he did. It makes sense for him to say, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Or when he he said to the Jews before Abraham was, I am. That makes sense. He said, I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I am the way and the truth and life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Unless he is, in fact... God incarnate, all this is just nonsense. But if he is, then it's logical what he says and does. I am the resurrection and the life, and all who believe in me will never die. The poor little baby in the manger doesn't say that and have it believed. But the word, the logos, who was in the beginning with God, he says it. And we believe it. And when that same person hangs on the cross and says, it's finished, we can receive that, can't we? We don't need to die anymore. See, he's done it. It's sufficient. That's enough. That was the plan. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he has given you the right to become the children of God. That's what it says. He says, he gives us the right to become children of God. That means the opportunity. Doesn't force us to become children of God, does he? Well, we have to sign the adoption papers is what we have to do. We have to say, yes, yes, I accept this adoption from you. Uh, You are not just a baby in a manger, but you are the one through whom all things were made. You are, in fact, God in the flesh. And you give me the open door to come into your family to believe in your name. And we have to sign the adoption papers. Well, let's, let's sit for just a few minutes. Let's do a little work and prayer this morning. As deep cries out.